Thank you, Ashley. Welcome everyone to another uh, Drawing 101 class for Artist Loft. I'm Adrienne Hodge and I'm thrilled to be partnering with Michael to bring you this ongoing drawing series. Uh, one moment. Let me get rid of that little message there on my computer. Um, so tonight is a bit of a supplementary class to um, the intro to perspective drawing class that we had about a month ago. So uh, it was called Intro to Linear Perspective. And this one is just a little bit extra piggybacking on that class that was, um, you know, the, the basics of, of linear perspective. So uh, tonight we're going to be really focusing on, you know, looking and observing perspective linear perspective and atmospheric perspective and sort of dissecting it and seeing how we can break it down to more basic forms and make it easier to digest because I know it's a very cerebral concept that a lot of people struggle with and if you understand it trying to apply it to your your drawing practice is can still be a struggle so um so yeah, and uh, I just wanted to mention that I am, uh, you know, a teaching artist, and I do a lot of independent stuff outside of these lovely Michael's classes. And I have a class starting next Thursday evening. That's an independent class um, that I'll be hosting by myself on Zoom um, called uh, Urban Sketching at Home. So it definitely applies to what we're doing tonight with uh, the perspective drawing studies. So if you're, you're interested in that, you can um, follow me on Instagram or um, find me online very easily. And uh, yeah, check out my, my independent classes. So I'll go ahead and switch to my tabletop view here. So like Ashley said, tag your work uh, that you make tonight or any class classwork that you do from previous classes on YouTube with the hashtags. Make it with Michael's or Michael's classes, and you can follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. And if you go to the uh, link tree link that I have in my bio, my little bio on um, Instagram, you can find the link to that urban sketching class. And here's my website and Facebook and email, and of course Instagram, where you can find me the most. And there's some of my personal work that I do with uh, calligraphy inks, do a lot of space scapes, but I also do a lot of, do a lot of things, portraits, um, mixed media stuff. Uh, I am a big fan of urban sketching and perspective drawing. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I saw in the chat before we got started that somebody was, um, wondering about the class next week. It's not going to be related to linear perspective and that should be up soon, the one on October 6th. I noticed that wasn't um, quite up yet in the, the class list. But on October 13th, we'll be starting this uh, four part series um, on creating a mixed media perspective drawing. And we'll be using the uh, reference photo that was linked in tonight's class to, so you can use the reference photo um, that I used for this. Uh, we'll be mapping that out tonight. You can, you know, do that along with me and then you'll be one step ahead for this class. But when this class begins on uh, October 13th, I will be doing, you know, how to do the layout in that one too. So you're not going to need this class tonight in order to join that four part series, but uh, we will be using this reference photo. So this is my mixed media piece using watercolor pencils, pen and ink. I did the layout in graphite pencil first. So it, it may be a, a nice little thing, but it was very involved. And so in order to break that down, that's gonna be a four part series and it will go into um, how to create a palette using the watercolor pencils, how to blend and mix the watercolor pencils, all that jazz. So um, check that out and yeah, I might pop that back on the screen at some point. So I've got a little agenda for tonight of all my points that I wanna make sure to cover. So we're gonna be observing and studying linear and atmospheric perspective. We're gonna sketch some thumbnails 
uh, for perspective drawing. We're going to be simplifying forms. We're going to do a little bit of value study in regards to perspective. Uh, we're going to talk about creating a perspective layout, like I said, and uh, making informed edits because there's definitely a lot more going on in this photograph than I included in my, my final piece here. So how to make informed edits when it comes to perspective drawing and adding an artist touch because we all have our own unique voice that comes across when we make a work of art. And so even though for that four part series, we'll be using this, you know, you can use your own photograph, by the way, um, but there, there will be a reference photo attached to those classes. And it's the same one, like I said, that was attached for tonight. But, you know, not all of our drawings are going to look the same because we're not robots, right? So embracing whatever happens in your work and following your own muse and where it takes you. So I'll definitely touch on how to do that a little bit tonight. Okay, so um, before we get started, I'm going to use a whole bunch of, of printouts. And by the way, if you're, uh, if you had, have not uh, been joining for previous classes, or if you missed the class on intro to uh, perspective drawing, I'll just review what I covered in that class real quick. Um, basically, I talked about uh, a little bit of art history and how Oh, let me find it here. In ancient times before, uh, well, before the Renaissance times, uh, we had things happening in artwork that showed, uh, that didn't reflect what we see with our eyes when we, we look at the world. And then after the Renaissance period, we started to see what we refer to as linear perspective and um, which is how we view the world, which is a bit of an optical illusion. And so I break that down in the intro to perspective drawing class. And then I talked about uh, one, two and three point perspective. And we drew a series of boxes in one point perspective and then a couple of boxes in two point perspective. I broke down these terms. And then uh, we did a few box or two boxes in three point perspective. So if you missed that class, uh, you can find that on YouTube. It was intro to linear perspective drawing. Okay, so uh, the basic difference between one and two point perspective uh, that I outlined in that class is this. So when we are looking at something that's in one point perspective, what's happening is we are it's the viewer's perspective is showing just one vanishing point on the horizon that uh, the orthogonal lines appear to converge at. And again, if anything I'm saying sounds confusing, then you want to check out that intro to perspective drawing class because I can't repeat it all and go into, you know, in depth like I, I'm doing tonight. But those uh, orth orthogonal lines are going to recede to one vanishing point on the horizon. And that's because we're standing in the middle of something. So I was on a walk earlier today and I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna make some reference photos right now. So I was walking down the center of the, the sidewalk and I took a photograph of the, the curb here from the, uh, the center of the, the sidewalk. So I'm just seeing one vanishing point where the orthogonal lines are all receding to and that is the horizontal lines which would be facing me and parallel if I were to face them but since they are traveling away from me the viewer they appear to recede they don't actually recede but when I looked at the corner of this curb and these little steps here leading to somebody's house now I'm seeing something in two point perspective. So that's the only difference between one and two point perspective is I'm looking at a corner or I'm looking down the center of something. So when I'm looking at the corner of a geometric form like a, uh, a box or a cube or a building or a curb, now I've got uh, orthogonal lines that are traveling to two points on the horizon. So the ones on this side are traveling to a vanishing point somewhere way over here outside of my view and all of the orthogonal lines on this side are traveling to a vanishing point that are way over here out of my um out of my 
my peripheral view, but uh, there are two points on the horizon. So when I talk about the horizon, I'm not necessarily talking about the horizon line where the earth meets the sky. So to illustrate that, I've got a lot of photos here and they find the ones I wanna use. And um, I am not directly looking at the chat, but we've got Ashley, our lovely moderator. So if there are any questions that are jumping out right now, um, you know, Ashley can interrupt me at any point um, and I'll, I'll definitely pause and, and ask for questions. Um, at several we, we did have one question already, um, and that's, should they be starting on watercolor paper? Uh, not tonight, no. We're just, we're just doing studies tonight. Tonight's going to be all about thumbnail sketches, studies. Um, we're not going to necessarily, we're not getting started on, on that piece. Um, I only brought that up because we're using this, the reference photo that was linked in the class tonight was the same reference photo that I used for that one. So if you wanted to get a jump start on it, you, you could, because the reference photo is linked in the, uh, the class description or in the, on the supply list. Um, yeah, tonight we're just gonna be sketching. We're just gonna end up with maybe some thumbnails that look like this tonight. Just some very basic little um, thumbnail sketches and hopefully gain a deeper understanding of a linear perspective and also we will sort of tear apart some photos and map them out but I will repeat all of this the, or at least the part about lit the layout I'll repeat that at the beginning of that that four-part series so uh, you're not this class isn't necessary for that that class um, it's just supplement we also had someone ask what is the ruler that you are using um, so I linked a uh, artist loft brand ruler on the supply list, but I am using I am actually using a T square ruler because I left my artist loft ruler at home. So um, I've got I like this T square one. It's because I can you know hook it onto to the end of a uh, paper. And artist loft does make a, a a lot of really great graph rulers. So. Any ruler will do, even a, uh, a straight edge will, will work. Okay, so what I wanted to talk about was horizon lines. So when it comes to horizon lines in a linear perspective, it's very easy to get confused because for one, most of the sort of grade school examples that are used are often going to be these very simplified you know, like in the center of railroad tracks, like I used this reference photo um, for the intro to perspective drawing. This is an extremely straightforward uh, one point perspective image of railroad tracks because if I trace the uh, lines, the orthogonal lines and find that vanishing point, it's pretty much right there where the tree line is, where the earth meets the sky, right? And so, that's a very comfortable conclusion to make because, you know, if I'm having, if I'm a really, you know, raw beginner and I'm really struggling with concepts of linear perspective, then that's going to make a lot of sense to my brain. But then I'm going to look at a photo like these and all of these photos were taken by my, my lovely boyfriend who happens to be a truck driver and sends me lots of great photos from the road. Um, so he was even impressed when I, he saw this little, uh, you know, layout that I made of them. He's like, are all those my photos? They looked different, I guess, um, laid out like this. But anyway, when we look at a photo like this, our brain might start to short circuit because it's like, wait a second, I'm seeing lines that are receding to a point, but then they curve around a bend and hey, that's nowhere near where the earth meets the sky, right? And then something like this photo, oh yeah, this one is really can be confusing because look what's happening here. So basically the, the conclusion is you can have lots of different types of perspective present in one photograph. And that's gonna happen depending on the geographic you know, surroundings that you happen to be standing in the middle of, right? Because it's all about the viewer's perspective. 
And so just because I've got one vanishing point here for these, you know, more obvious orthogonal lines. So if I were to trace my orthogonal lines here, and I'm just gonna draw on the photo and find that, let me use a, I, I had the Artist Loft 101 uh, kit on the supply list is all you need tonight. So that's got a variety of materials. It's got the charcoal pencils, graphite pencils, pens. You can use whatever you feel most comfortable with. I'm gonna use a charcoal pencil right now just so it shows up against my photograph. Okay, so I've got these lines here. And then this should be ending up at an intersection. Okay, so right there, there's the vanishing point for these orthogonal lines. And this orthogonal line, you might think would go to that one, but these are actually going somewhere over here. So there, they've got their own vanishing point that might be right there. And then these lines right here, Actually, that does end up at around the same vanishing point. So it's always good to map it out like this. But my point is you can have multiple, multiple points of view in one image. And so the way to figure out what's going on and where your vanishing points are, are simply to take your ruler and just start tracing lines to where those lines intersect and uh, where they recede. It's not necessarily going to be where the earth meets the sky every time. That would be a very you know, comfortable conclusion to always draw, but that's not the case. But there is this line right here, right? And so this is, so the horizon line that these lines uh, intersect at has more to do with the viewer's eye line. So the viewer is, uh, my boyfriend taking the photograph here in his truck. And so where his eye line is seeing these points intersect, that is the horizon, the linear perspective horizon line. But the horizon where the earth meets the sky is right here, right? And so same thing for all of these photos. For this one, the linear perspective, uh, vanishing point where these lines intersect on the the viewer's eye line which is the the horizon line that we're concerned with would be right here but then the road does continue to curve and go even further so there's actually you know there's a few different vanishing points happening here so it can be really confusing to map out uh, a drawing like this so the best thing to do when you have a situation like this is to um, break it down to the the geometric forms that you're seeing and map out you know pay attention to not just the linear perspective but also the atmospheric perspective so atmospheric perspective is what occurs when we don't have any geometric forms to talk about in um, in an image so something like this. So we don't have any roads or buildings or anything in this photo. We've just got mountains, but we've still got perspective happening. Um, we've got a lot of atmospheric perspective happening in these photographs, but we also have a road and, um, you know, like in this one, we've got lights and all kinds of geometric forms. The cars, the cars are, are following uh, per, the rules of perspective because they're getting smaller and smaller as they go back in space they're made up of geometric forms so when we're drawing those we'd have to take into account the linear perspective on all of those items but when we're looking at this we only have the atmospheric perspective um and let me let you guys talk a little bit somebody uh or several people in the chat um tell me what is atmospheric perspective i'll let ashley read the best responses. Okay. 
Nobody in the crowd knows what atmospheric perspective is? <laughs> All right, I'm happy to tell you. Uh, what do you think it is, just from what I'm talking about, from the words so, atmospheric perspective, and we don't have any line, any geometric forms happening, so. We have some good answers. There's um, using color to create depth, natural okay. surroundings, um, when items appear hazy in the distance. So those are some of the answers. Okay, yeah, all of those things are correct. So uh, definitely color and light is, is affected by it. And yes, things will appear hazier in the distance. So it's basically just the, um, the effects of the atmosphere on, on anything that we see across a great distance. So when we're looking at the world, we see things that are close to us appear their actual size, right? If the car is right in front of me, it's going to be the size that my eyes interpret the car to be. But if the car starts to drive away from me, then the car is going to appear to get smaller and smaller as it drives away, right? We know that the car doesn't actually get smaller. We just know, we understand that it's a optical illusion created by distance, right? So objects appear to get smaller as they go back in space. There, we've also got overlapping. So if a, a tree is in front of another tree, it's going to be overlapping that other tree. Um, same thing with the mountains, they're gonna be overlapping each other. And so things that are closer to us are gonna have more depth or sorry, more, um, more deep So the example of, of that and then all of these photos are really um, as we're seeing warm light here on the things that are close to us. And then we see cool colors on uh, things that are farther away in the distance. And if we were to drive close to those mountains, they're probably going to be more, you know, they're going to be warm colors as we approach them because they're going to be the colors that they are, right? Rocks are going to be brown and reds and uh, the light will hit them directly and we'll see them for, you know, their actual colors. But we see this blue haziness falls on things in the distance. It's not how they don't, you know, those mountains don't actually become blue. They just appear to be blue because of the, the atmospheric distortion, um, which is really interesting. And also, yeah, we've got haziness, so less detail just because it's farther away, right? We're not going to see uh, the details on something because it's farther away, but also the just distortion of the atmosphere is going to make it sort of hazy and blurry and um, appear duller. And so blues and, and purple colors, cool colors will fall on the things that are far away from us in the distance. And then one other thing I wanted to point out. Um, so everything gets smaller as it goes towards the horizon line. So the trees are going to appear teeny tiny towards the horizon here, right? Um, and the bigger trees are, are going to appear bigger as they, they get closer to us. So if we're looking at the, uh, the picture plane as, as like top to bottom, below the horizon line, things at the bottom are larger. So I'm just gonna sketch that out and you can sketch this with me if you want. And I'm just using my hard charcoal pencil that I still have in my hand. So if I've got, I'm just gonna arbitrarily draw a horizon line in the middle here. So if the trees that are close to me are in the lower part of the, the picture plane here, and we've got overlapping trees going back in space, they're gonna get smaller and smaller as they get closer to the horizon, right? We've got overlapping and getting smaller. And then when it comes to the sky, uh, same thing, but what's at the top of the sky is closer to us. So these clouds are closer to us than clouds on the horizon. If we had some clouds close to the horizon, they would be really small or like right here. These clouds are closer to us. The bigger clouds are at the top of the sky, smaller clouds at the bottom of the sky. So it goes in reverse order. So big clouds at the top, 
this would be the middle ground of the sky. And then in the background of the sky, things will get smaller. So everything gets smaller as it goes towards the horizon line. And every time I outline that in a class, people always have a little aha moment. So can't forget to, to say that. Okay, so any questions before I move on a bit here to um, doing more of a layout? So, so far uh, we're just observing and studying, um, but I wanna start sketching some thumbnails and simplifying forms and all this other stuff. So any questions? We do have a question. Um, is the horizon line supposed to draw the eye? Um, like attract the viewer's eye? Not necessarily. Um, so when it comes to composition, that is a really great question. When it comes to composition, it's all about what the, the artist, the photographer, what you emphasize. So this would be a good time to show you this cool photo um, from my, my collection here of photos from the road. Um, because there's lots of what would be the focal point here? It's not necessarily the point on the horizon um, because there's several different horizon points here because what's happening in the, the rear view mirror, right? We've got one vanishing point there on the horizon, one vanishing point there. So it's what is the artist emphasizing? And uh, when it comes to composition, typically what's emphasized or where you want the focal point to be is where you um, where the rule of thirds comes in. So I, I've talked about this in a number of other classes so far. So the rule of thirds is when we've got any uh, frame, if we divide that into thirds, so we've got on the horizontal and the vertical axis, and it doesn't have to be perfectly in thirds because this is not necessarily perfectly in thirds here, but whatever's happening where these points intersect tends to be where the viewer's eye goes in a composition. Um, so when you drop the horizon line down to the bottom thirds or the top thirds, which is happening in pretty much all of these photographs, the uh, horizon line is definitely not halfway here. It's more in the top thirds. Here it's in the bottom third line. Here it's the bottom third and here it's the bottom third. So yes, the horizon line would be where, um, actually right here would be the point where the horizontal and vertical axes are intersecting. So the viewer's eye might be drawn to right here or right here, or right here, or right here. And so by just putting points of interest on those lines of thirds, and my boyfriend is, an, is a photographer, so he's definitely got those things in mind when he's taking these photographs, you know, that it's no accident that those points are happening where interesting things are, are happening in the photograph. And a lot of us do these things in, intuitively when we take pictures, just because it looks nice to us. I mean, they're proven as aesthetically pleasing uh, composition rules because we find them aesthetically pleasing. So when you're taking a photograph of your plate of food at the, the dinner table or, you know, uh, arranging anything for to make, you know, a nice, Instagrammable post, you're probably following the rules of composition without realizing that you are. Does that answer the question? I feel like I went way off there. We have a couple more questions if you're ready. Um, first is how do you use the T-square ruler? Um, well, I didn't put T-square rulers on the supply <laughs> list. It just happens to be what I have. Um, on my desk right now. So I don't want to um, go well, but you just hook it onto the, the end of your paper. It hooks onto the, the edge of the paper and then it allows you, it helps you make a straight line. So you don't necessarily have to line it up perfectly because a, a lot of people have a hard time when they're drawing, uh, just scooching the ruler a little bit. They'll get it lined up straight, but then it kind of curves. So it's just nice to be able to, it just hooks on to the, the edge of the paper. 
Thank you. And then our next question is, will there be an explanation or focus on drawing humans from exaggerated perspectives? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, I mean, there's definitely going to be a lot of portrait drawing coming up pretty soon. I've got uh, facial proportion basics on the, the, the schedule in the next uh, couple months. And then from there, there will be lots of portrait drawing classes. Um, but I can, I can definitely put that in my notes for a, to plan for a class like that. That would be a great class for advanced students, um, for sure. That's a challenging uh, thing to do. It's all about the foreshortening. So foreshortening is where information is missing in the, the reference that you're observing, but you know that it's still there. So you just draw what you see. So if I were to point my finger directly at the camera right now, all you're seeing is the top of my finger. You're not seeing, you know, the middle part of my finger, anything. So that's foreshortening. So a lot of information is missing and you're just drawing what you see. So um, when it comes to drawing humans like that, that can be very tricky. And there will be a class on body proportions and all that. So foreshortening will definitely come up in, in those classes. Um, since this is such a long ongoing uh, drawing series with Artist Loft, I've tried to structure it just like I would any um, you know, year long class, which is I would start out with the basics and then I would move on to uh, linear perspective and then portraits and then, you know, keep coming back to, to all the things because there's kind of three main subject matter when it comes to traditional art. We've got still lifes, landscapes and portraits, right? So we're, we're almost there to the portraits who are people are impatient for that or not impatient, but excited. Um, okay, so moving on to sketching some thumbnails of all of these. So that was definitely an important aside there. I appreciate that question about um, focal points and, and what you're emphasizing in regards to the horizon line. I mean, the viewer's eye is definitely going to be drawn to the horizon line, but it might not necessarily be the focal point. Okay, so which one of these am I going to sketch a little thumbnail of? Let's go with, well, let's do one I've just been pointing to a lot here. I'm going to do this one, and I'm going to switch to an H pencil for this so I can er erase my lines. Um, I'm not going to uh, use the ruler for thumbnail sketching because I want to just get some, some quick, loose, sketches going and I don't want to judge myself. So I had an entire class on thumbnail sketching for still life objects. And this was the example from that class. And so it's basically just a series of small sketches in your sketchbook that you do to find the best composition and troubleshoot any issues that you might be having with uh, that, that reference photo or you know, with that reference, you know, for a still life object, same thing. And so that class on thumbnails is on YouTube and you can go back and watch that, but we're going to do some thumbnails now for linear perspective. And I am just using my H pencil and I'm not using my ruler because thumbnails are supposed to be just quick, loose things. So here's some examples of some thumbnail sketches that I did in the park while teaching a class on urban sketching. It's just quick, loose little sketches where you find a good composition and work out any issues that you might have with that composition before you start working on final paper. So I wanted to talk about how we could do something like this with a reference photo to simplify form. So I realize this looks extremely elementary here, but I was just trying to think of like, what would be a device that would really help break down the, the basic forms that we're seeing in, in an image with linear perspective so that people don't get so overwhelmed. So this was from a photograph of the uh, front of my apartment building. And I actually don't have the original reference photo here, but uh, there's 
a big bush here. And this is you know, just a, a pen and ink and, and watercolor sketch that I, I did from the same reference photo. So we've got a big round bush here, round bush here, and then the sidewalk and the building itself, right? So if I were to break that down to its most basic forms, I've got a sphere for the bush. I've got a series of rectangles for the building and the sidewalk. I've got a triangle for this little intersection at the sidewalk and another triangle here where the orthogonal lines happen. So that can be really helpful way to break down the geometric forms that you're seeing. The other device that I came up with, and I'm sure I wasn't the first person to come up with this, but I like to think that I did was, okay, if we, I'm gonna sketch this using a bit of a radius here. So I've got this basic, this, this image and my horizon, it's a square and my horizon line is towards the bottom thirds, not um, completely the bottom thirds. And then my vanishing point we already figured out was right about there in the middle. Well, if I take that and I'm not even going to use my ruler, I'm just going to make like a radius of lines that come out from that point. I'm just going to radiate lines out like a star. Well, now I've got something that will help me understand where the orthogonal lines are in this image. Because now if I start to put in the road, it just so happens that the road falls right about here where I put a couple of my, my lines radiating out. And even though I don't have anything, any geometric forms coming into the sky here, if I did, if I had like a building happening right here, then one of these radius lines would tell me where the roof of that building was on the side. So I could make a, a lot of adjustments and create, you know, a convincing perspective drawing just from radiating out my lines like this. So that can be a helpful thing to do for a, a linear perspective study on a thumbnail drawing just to, you know, help your brain understand where those lines are going to go. So that's kind of part one of a thumbnail sketch. Or just keeping that in mind, I'll just start to sketch that road. And I'm going to make some edits here. So I'm not necessarily I'm just going to put my vanishing point right about there and sketch in the road. The road doesn't follow the orthogonal lines perfectly. It does curve out a little bit more like this. And then we've got this road over here, which was on a, a totally separate thing. So I'm just sketching in the, the, the main areas of interest. So I'll do a little bit of this tree line. the mountains and then the big cloud. So this is just mapping it out. I'm just creating a little thumbnail layout. And if I wanted to break this down to its simplest geometric forms, like I did with that other image that I showed you, I'm just going to look for for the shapes and forms that are that are happening here. So I've got my horizon line. I've got a triangle. I've got another triangle. I've got an oval shape that overlaps another oval shape or an egg shape for those trees. I've got another triangle right here to help me find the road. And then for the mountains, I could say 
triangle, 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 etc. So that's just a little thing that I came up with that I thought could be helpful for people who are just really overwhelmed by a linear perspective that maybe breaking it down that way to just these most basic forms. And by the way, if anybody's familiar with the the Lascaux cave paintings, the, uh, you know, what's, what's thought to be is the, the oldest, well, it's not the oldest known art, but, you know, it's still very impressive that uh, 18,000 years ago that we were seeing an understanding of perspective on the, the cave walls in France there. And there, there's so many other, um, you know, evidence of of ancient humans understanding things in art. But what was so impressive about the Lescaux cave paintings is there's overlapping. They have things overlapping, you know, bison overlapping other bison. They've got an understanding of the, the size of a human in relationship to, to a bison, things like that. Um, you know, when art historians are, are looking at, at those, that's what's so amazing is, is that. And when you're teaching, you know, a, a child I know we've got a lot of kids in the classes, uh, in these classes, how to draw uh, in atmospheric and linear perspective. Overlapping is a big deal because sometimes we start to draw, you know, a child will start to draw something that is being overlapped by something else, but they won't account for the overlapping. They will sort of do an x-ray drawing of that thing on top of the other thing. And you're seeing, you know, lines from one tree coming through the other tree or one branch, you know, not accounting for the overlapping. So it may seem like a very basic concept to put in your art, but um, it's actually a very, you know, higher order thinking skill there. So, uh, so using basic forms like that, just breaking it down to like, well, that's an egg shape and that's overlapping another egg shape. Or when it comes to the cars, uh, we could draw just a box because it is a box, what I'm seeing of the car. And it, I am seeing a little bit of the side of the box here and I'm seeing the top of the box. And then the next car would be a slightly smaller box, but I'm still seeing a little bit of the top of the box and the side of the box, et cetera. Um, so breaking it down to cubes or boxes instead of trying to draw the car just to get in a basic understanding of what's happening with the the atmospheric and linear perspective before you move on to trying to uh, map a perfect layout can be really helpful any questions about that before i move on doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment So I'll find a blank page that doesn't have something underneath it here. All right, so I said I wanted to talk about a layout using that reference photo, even though this this will this will come back in that, that four part series. You know, I'll I'll do this at the beginning of that class as well. But for photographs that have two point perspective or vanishing points that are way off the page. So if you're looking at a photograph in one point perspective, you're just by definition, you're going to have the vanishing point in the photograph itself because there's just one point. And if there's one point perspective, it means the viewer is standing in the middle or is in the middle of what they're viewing, right? So the vanishing point is in the picture plane. So we don't have to do any crazy things like this to find the vanishing points because it's, it's there in the photograph. But when it comes to two point and three point perspective, the vanishing point is usually going to, or both the vanishing points, either one or both will not be in the photograph. Um, so there are examples of two point perspective where let me see if I have one in my printout where one of the vanishing points will be in the photograph, but then the other one is in your 
is way off the page. Let's see. Okay, I don't have any examples like that, but oftentimes one vanishing point may be off the page, but the other one is way off the page. But with this one, both of the vanishing points are off the page. So what we need to do here is either make the photograph small enough so that you can uh, just tape it down into your sketchbook. So I have an example of doing that. Right here. This is an old example that I used for a number of, of demonstrations. But um, so here, I made the photograph small enough so that I could just tape it down into my sketchbook with this cool tape that a student had at the time. And then we found both, both of the vanishing points on the paper this way. But if the photograph is larger, then the way to go is to take a piece of tape and run the piece. Well, first you have to find the horizon line. So you're gonna run the piece of tape right where the horizon line is. So you'll um, first take your ruler in order to find the, the horizon. You'll have to find the, one of the vanishing points first. So I'm gonna just trace the orthogonal lines in this image and see where, where they intersect. So I traced this line first then I traced another line. I just started tracing lines and see they kind of ran all over the place for a minute there until I found where all of those lines were intersecting. And so where they were intersecting, that's my vanishing point. So that would be the vanishing point on this side of the corner, right? Because if we've got a corner, we're looking at the corner of this house, we've got two vanishing points. So the orthogonal lines on this side are traveling to that vanishing point. And then on this side, they are way over here. But in order to find the horizon line, I had to first find where the points were intersecting. And so now I know I took this photograph that the viewer, me, was my eye line was about right here. And so the horizon line falls at the viewer's eye line. So then I took my tape. And so I found the other way you can find the horizon line um, in a photo with linear perspective, other than tracing the um, all of the orthogonal lines, is just to look at it and just find the equatorial line, the equator line. So if I look at this below, this line, I've got my orthogonal lines are angling down. And then above that line, the orthogonal lines are angling up. So if I just observe it and just look at it, I can see that, you know, lines are, I'm seeing orthogonal lines at an angle here, they appear to be diagonal lines, but then the fence line right here appeared straight. So basically just, or the, the under side of this, um, this window is a straight line, but above the horizon line, the top of the windows are angling down. So I can just look for where I see those orthogonal lines become straight. And that's my sort of equator line, right? So that's the, the horizon line. So that might be a more complicated way of finding it. But once you you get good at observing linear perspective, it's pretty easy to see. Like in this photograph, um, the orthogonal lines are angling down above the horizon line. They're still angling down. They're still angling down. They're still angling down. And then right about here, they start to angle up. So now I know that the horizon line, the viewer's eye line is somewhere between here and here because above that line, things are angling down and below that line, things are angling up. So I know that it has to be right there. So that's, that's another way to find the horizon line. And once you found the horizon line, then you can take a piece of tape and just run the tape. Oh, sorry, I'm scooting it outside of Gail's view. Just run the piece of tape along the, where that median line is. 
and then trace your, I might run out of my, my screen view here, hopefully not. Okay, good, it looks like my intersection's gonna happen where I need it to. I'm gonna switch back to a pencil. Or actually, I'm gonna use a pen since I did a pen. This one before. Okay, so I'm just gonna start tracing those orthogonal lines and see where they intersect. And it looks like right about there. So that is my vanishing point. So that's VP1. And that's, let me see if I can get them both in the view. Just barely. Um, I mentioned this in the, the other intro to perspective drawing class that one time I was, when I was teaching high school, I had a student with a photo that had a three point perspective that was so highly skewed that we had to run a piece of tape all the way down the length of the table, like really far away. We had to use a, um, a meter stick and had to like find the end of the meter stick and then even do it again. And she was like, we really don't have to do this. And I was like, we're doing it. And I like ran the piece of tape all the way down her table until we found that vanishing point that was really far away. And like, when you're doing something like that, that's that, you know, complicated, it can be really hard to translate that you know, perfectly to your drawing or in your sketchbook. But what it helps when you do that is now you can visualize it. Now you can see, you know, if it's that far away, then I know, um, you know, when I'm viewing these angles, if those angles are, you know, too wide or, or too small, if I'm kind of squishing things or if I'm, you know, forcing a certain perspective onto it, it's gonna be really obvious that I'm really off. Um, another way to, um, to help with a layout like this is to, so if your brain is just having a hard time wrapping itself around something like this, then I would advise measuring the, uh, the photograph itself and just making a, a sketch, a thumbnail sketch that is exactly the size of whatever you printed the photo out to be. And you could even shrink the photograph down so that it's even smaller so that you can tape it down in your sketchbook and more easily do this. So, you know, you could shrink the photo down so that it's like, you know, two by three inches or something. And then after you've done that, um, you're just going to replicate that same size box in your sketchbook and you know, draw a box that is exactly the same size as your photograph. And then all you have to do is, well, here, let me do it with one of my more simplified images since we're running out of time here. I've got too many, too many images on my desk now. Here we go. Okay, I'll just go back to this one. If I were to measure the size of this photograph <clears throat> on the page, it's four by four. And then I just need to draw a four by four box. And then I can create, you could do a grid. And at some point in this drawing series, I will have a class on how to use grid drawing um, for things like this. But you can do just a um, sort of a casual version of a grid. And this is what I used to do when I, I taught at paint and sip places, which was 
find the uh, focal points or areas of interest and just measure where they are and create a bit of a connect the dots for yourself. So if I'm measuring where the top of this tree is in this four by four photograph, it is almost two inches up. So then I go to my four by four box and I make a little tick mark um, two inches up. Okay, where's the horizon line? The horizon line is about not quite one and a half, but almost one and a half inches up. So I just create a little connect the dot for myself and I can do that with all the, the important things and then connect those together. And then I'll have things arranged where I want them to be. So that's what I would advise doing if you're getting overwhelmed by a layout like this where your vanishing points are so far off of the page that you're having to sketch them on your desk on a piece of tape like this is you can create a bit of a connect the dots for yourself so you'd measure the photograph and you'd say where's the top of the house here um you know it's this far down from the, the top of the the frame of the photo and you know find the intersecting point and put your dot there etc. So you do that for all the most important aspects of this photo. And I'll repeat all of this when um, that class comes around on October 13th at the beginning of this class, because we will create the layout for this on watercolor paper to begin that mixed media piece. So we're just about out of time. Hopefully, um, I illuminated a lot of aspects of linear and atmospheric perspective for you and helped you understand how to break down an image with perspective so that you can um, better map it out and sketch it in your sketchbook and be prepared to draw it. And um, yeah, this was just meant to be a supplement for um, the intro to perspective class so that you know everybody could, could just have a better understanding because I, I know that class was just an hour long and I felt like I breezed past a lot of things and I just wanted to spend a little bit more time breaking it all down. Um, I'm seeing a lot of great comments, like it was very helpful. I'm glad to hear it. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, does anybody have anything they want to share? Any sketches? Um, that yeah, if you want to hold, if you want to hold up what you're working on, I'll spotlight you. Um, there was a question about how they should prepare for the next class. If you have any tips, it looks like you're going to be incorporating watercolor, so. Yeah, so th that that list for that uh, four part um, series on the the mixed media uh, perspective drawing there, you know, the supply list is all there. We're not going to use all of those supplies on class one, but we will, you know, use them by the, the end of that series. So they're just all there. The first class will just be using what we use to, tonight, mainly um, pencils and paper, well, the watercolor paper to map it out on there. Oh, lovely, Crystal. Thank, thanks for holding up your drawing. But yeah, we'll just be doing the layout in the first class. And then in the second class, we'll be adding pen and ink to it. In the third class, we'll make a palette with the watercolor pencils. And then uh, the last class, we'll just be finished. Yeah, and I did pop the link directly to that class in the chat. So okay, you can check out the supply list there. Yeah, and next week's class should be up in the, the class list pretty soon. It's, um, I believe it's gonna be a class on reflective surfaces. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Adrian, And thank you everybody. Have a great night. Thank you, have a good night.